Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome virtually to our Stories of Preservation and Progress for July 2022. I'm Mary Helen Dellinger, curator of the Manassas Museum System, and we are here in our collection storage space, as you can see behind me. And we're going to walk through this space today and take a look at uh, several of the things that we have in our collection that I don't think we've used these on exhibit before. And then we're going to take a field trip off-site to see um, another object that we have, our newest acquisition. So let's follow me down this aisle here and we'll take a look at our first, first piece. So this is a reed or a pump organ here beside me. It's one of the largest and heaviest pieces in our collection. Dates to about the late 19th century. So this one was made by the Cornish and Company in Washington, New Jersey. And you can kind of see up underneath the lid here, their name above the stops. A little bit difficult to make out, but it's right there. The Cornish and Company, uh, organ company, was one of the most successful organ and piano manufacturers in the United States. And they sold their instruments, like this one, through mail order catalogs. So when this organ arrived in Manassas, it likely arrived by train and then was delivered by wagon over bumpy country roads to its owner. Uh, since this method of delivery was, you know, going to be pretty harsh on the instruments because trains weren't really, you know, air conditioned back then and, and heat controlled, this organ would have gone through all types of rough handling. So the fact that it's in such great condition shows that it was really well made. These were well made pieces. Uh, the company that made this, uh, their factory burned down in 1922 and they never reopened. So after 1922, no more organs of this type. So I looked up this, this type of organ because I wasn't really familiar with it and I, I learned lots of cool trivia things. So those of you that are familiar with me know that I love trivia. There are 12 different types of antique organs and they all have one thing in common and that is you have to pump them with your feet to make them work, hence the name pump organ. That's more of a, of a term that the public has come up with. And here are the two foot pedals down here. They all show, say, Cornish and Company, Washington, New Jersey, so we know they're not replacements. If you ask the manufacturer of this piece, they would have called it a reed organ because inside the casing here are brass reeds that produce the sound. So those two names can be used interchangeably. This particular example is a parlor organ, um, one of the largest types of pump organs made. There's only two bigger and those you would have seen in like churches and places like that. So let's look at the few of the features. I know Rachel, my great videographer, has been going over the front of this. So this is a standard size keyboard for this particular organ. It's only one row, unlike church organs that you see today that are multiple rows stacked on top of each other. The stops are all right here. You can see in the back. Some of them are missing their labels. This is just paper that's in there. But you can kind of see that the, the different words are on there and that um, tells you what type of sound it would have helped produce. The two foot pedals that are down at the bottom are much bigger than your typical piano pedals. And they also function differently than a piano pedal. As I mentioned earlier, you have to actually pump these to make the organ play. So you can see when I push on the keys, nothing happens. So you have to actually be pumping this to get it to go. Piano pedals serve to modulate the sound. They do different things, dampen the sound and, and other types of things. So piano pedals are completely different from this. On the back side of this, there's allegedly a serial number. Um, I did not try and pull this out to take a look. And speaking of the weight of this, because this is very heavy, you'll notice here on the side, and there's one over here on this side as well, those are handles that would help with carrying this piece. Now, some examples had mirrors all up here at the top, down the sides. Ours only has the one here in the center. And then there's a beautiful carving that's all over. The music stand right here and up along the top. And then little places here where you could set different things, a metronome if you needed that for whatever reason. Um, or, or a light if you needed to, to light up your, your keyboard. Now, all that's great, interesting stuff, but the most interesting thing about this piece is that it was owned by Oswald Robinson's family. Now, the Robinsons were free African Americans that were living on what is today National Battlefield land and were important members of the local African American community. Uh, the Oswald uh, Robinson family has donated many, many pieces to our collection over the years, and this organ is one of them. It is also the biggest thing that they've donated. So here this beautiful piece is that I wanted to share with you today. So now we're going to move to a different aisle of our 
collection storage. We're going to back up. I'm going to slide by Rachel, and we're going to go over here. Rachel, be careful of this box right here. Okay, so this is also a fun piece. When the staff of the Manassas Museum was emptying out the Speedin House in preparation for putting it on the market for sale, we found this hanging on the back of a door that every time I'd ever been in there was just propped open. It was an interior door of the house. This is a chalkboard that has what I believe to be a music lesson being taught by Virginia Speed and Carper. So you can see here written, yes, this old, old style chalkboard for those of you that re remember those things. Now, the door that this was hanging on was, was the door that separated her piano room from the kitchen. So when you close the door, this was hanging right by her piano that was in there. She had an upright that she would teach her students on. So we also know that uh, Virginia Carper was a beloved piano teacher. Um, she taught a thousand students during the course of her career here in Manassas. Um, many, many people remember her, um, remember taking lessons from her. Uh, some are in the music field today that took lessons from her. So we think that this is in her own hand. So that's kind of a cool piece of Virginia Speed and Carper um, history. We also have some of her music in our collection that she um, composed herself. So this kind of goes along with, with the musical collection. All right, we're going to continue down this row here to take a look at this collection of flat irons. So these are fun pieces um, that I wanted to, to share with you. You can see there's six here. Well, there's really five flat irons and one fluting iron. So we'll, we'll talk about both of these types of irons. So all of these are pretty much the same. They weigh between five and nine pounds and all um, date to about the 19th century. The tip on the end, you can see how it's got the little square, just like what we have today, um, was for getting around buttons. So you can kind of see how it's got the tip on the end. So this is a pretty heavy piece. Now, in order to prepare these for use, if you've never used an iron like this, I have one, but I use it for a doorstop. So if, if you have an iron like this, you put the entire thing in inside of your stove that had a fire going in it, like a wood burning fire. And it literally sat inside the stove to heat up. Now, most homes at that time had a fire going at all times in the kitchen for cooking, boiling water, washing, whatever it was you, you needed hot water for, because we didn't have a way to heat it up with water heaters. So the iron would sit in there and when it was time to, when it was sufficiently hot, you had to reach in and snatch it out of the fire in order to use. So notice all of these handles they have one thing in common. They are all also cast iron. So not only is the iron getting heat up, heated up, the handle is heating up too. So you would have to wrap a, a cloth or something around it. So these things were dangerous. I mean, you could really, third degree burns were not uncommon. You could easily set something on fire. I mean, and young girls and women were the ones that were using these. So temperature control with these was a huge thing. After you would pull this out of the fire, it would immediately start to cool off. So if it, if it cooled off too much, you're not going to get the wrinkles out of your clothes. If you used it when it was too hot, you could scorch the clothes. You had to apply water by hand, like if you're sprinkling water on something. So this one probably weighs about nine pounds. This one feels pretty heavy to me. So imagine pushing this hot thing around. I mean, that's, that's how you iron clothes back then. In addition to, um, the care for this, you had to constantly be sanding down the bottom because soot would build up. And then you also had to grease them on a regular basis to prevent rust from building up from as they would get like hot and you'd use water and things like that. So this maintenance of the iron was, was a big deal. Now, I found this very interesting. Wealthier homes usually had multiple irons that they could use at one time. So you would have two being heated or kept warm and one in use, and then you would switch out. That, according to the internet, has led to the phrase, too many irons in the fire. Sounds good to me. Don't know if that's true or not, but I thought I would share that here. Now, remember that pushing this around is not easy. Um, remember I said they weighed five to nine pounds. In addition to this, um, you would need a trivet for the bottom because if you just set this down in the middle of ironing to adjust your clothes, you'd burn the top of your table or your ironing board or whatever you might have. We do not have a trivet that would have come with this. Most of the trivets would have taken the shape of this. It would have been a little bit bigger than this. It was a square with a triangle in the center that the iron would sit down into. We just do not have one of those. Now, 
The one interesting iron that we have here that looks a little bit different than all the others is this one. And you will notice that the bottom of this one is round and it also is not flat, it's pleated. So this is called a fluting iron and this was used to give petticoats their flare. So you would have had again a piece that we don't have which would have been the bottom piece that functioned like the trivet that would have had a, a flute to it that was opposite this. So you would lay your garment across the bottom and you would take your hot fluting iron and roll it across the top and it gave the, it gave the garment its distinctive flare. So that's how, you would, that's how you would do that. So with all of this knowledge in hand, the weight of it, how you had to maintain it and everything, I think you will agree that the electric irons we have today, which weigh about two pounds, um, are much easier to use. And even easier if you use a dry cleaner like what I do. So always a good, a good thing to have somebody else do it for you. So the last thing that we're gonna look at here in collection storage is probably my favorite piece in the collection. It's also our strangest piece. This was acquired in 1976 from the Rohr family. It's an interesting piece of art. We keep it in this small box that was created by a local resident when he was a young man. His name was Enos Newman. And for some odd reason, he felt compelled to make this interesting piece. We'll set it right here and pull it out. Got the curator gloves on. The staff lovingly calls this moose on fungus. Moose on fungus. So you're like, okay, what would that be? It's our accession label. This is literally a piece of tree fungus. You see the back? With moose etched into the front of it with like an etching tool. And you can see there are two here and one in the background. We do not know why Mr. Newman felt compelled to create moose on fungus, but he did. And it came to the museum in 1976 and myself and all the previous museum staff that have preceded me um, love this piece. As we see each other in professional conferences, we talk about moose on fungus. They also called it the same thing. So this is in fact, the most unique piece that we have in our collection that I literally have no explanation for. And we'll see the back again. It looks to me like at some point it was shellacked, which I assume that it was because it's not flaking apart. This would be the only piece in our collection that would be what would be considered a living history thing since it came from organic material and it's not, I mean, this part's man-made, but the piece itself is not man-made. So there we go, moose on fungus. We hope to display this in our newly renovated museum. So now we're gonna pause this video while Rachel and I jump in the van and drive across town to Annaberg so you can see something really cool that we just got for our collection. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. We have come across town or just a few blocks away from our collection storage area. And here we are on the property at Annaberg. I hope behind me, you can see this fantastic windmill, the newest donation to the Manassas Museum. A huge thank you to Jim and Carol Robeson for this fantastic gift. Windmills are machines that harness the power of wind for a specific purpose. Um, they could provide power for grinding grain, for threshing, for generating electricity, or for pumping water. Now the windmills that you would have seen around Manassas during the late 19th and into the 20th centuries were for that latter purpose, for pumping water. So the windmill behind me was recently installed on the grounds here at Annaberg just in the last few weeks. So if you wanna drive by, you can see it easily from your car. Um, there used to be a windmill on this property, just not in that location. It was located off at a distance from the house, but we can see it in historic photos that were taken during the time. There was also one at Liberia that was, was uh, well documented in various photographs. So our, our particular windmill has a 21 foot tower, and that's just the triangular base that goes up to the eight foot diameter fan at the top. That's the round part that you see in the picture. And then we have the vane on the back, making this a medium sized example of a windmill. Uh, the vane is marked Air Motor Chicago. You can see that there in the letters. This company was founded in 1888 to uh, make windmills. That was their idea. They were gonna make windmills to help farmers in America. Um, the first year that they offered them, they sold a whopping 24 windmills. 24 units were sold, but they stuck with it because they knew they had a good idea and it didn't take long for that to catch on. And soon thousands were being sold annually. And they continue to be in business today. Aeromotor Chicago is still in Zistix today, but they're just called Aeromotor and they're operating out of Texas. They've moved all around. They've been in and out of the country during their years of operation. They still make windmills, but they look a little bit different today and they call them wind turbines. So I'm sure you've seen those. They're kind of the, 
the slender towers that have like the three pronged things at the top. So a little bit different than the windmills that you might think of when you hear that word. So those are some of the fantastic pieces that we have in our collection. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you at a museum program coming up soon.